All right. Uh, hey, all. Um, this is going to be the first true lecture of the semester. Um, this lecture is going to be focusing on the phylum periphera. On uh, Wednesday or Thursday, I'll go over microscopes in much more detail. But before I get started, uh, I just want to say a few things. Um, make sure you check TopNet and uh, you find out which section you are in. Um, this was a source of confusion uh, for several of you. Uh, so make sure you check uh, which section you are in on TopNet and then you go to the appropriate uh, time um, and those times are specified on Blackboard. Um, I know the Blackboard course title is Bio 225-001 but that's not the course section um, that you are in or you may be in. Another thing I want to mention is uh, good job everybody for wearing your masks. Uh, just keep up the good work uh, and continue to wear your mask when you're in public um, and in this class. So before we get into our first phylum of periphera, uh, we have to describe really what uh, kingdom we're in. Um, so uh, I mentioned this very briefly uh, when we were in class last Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, when I was talking about uh, taxonomy and how there's this basic uh, hierarchy of uh, how we organize organisms on this planet. And so there's a couple things that everything in this class will be a part of. One of that is the domain Eukarya and the other one is the kingdom Animalia. So to answer this question on what distinguishes kingdom Animalia from the other kingdoms, we have to look at a uh, much more broader picture. Um, and so you might recognize this from my previous uh, 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 lecture um, from last Wednesday or last Thursday. And so this is a tree of life um, from 2016. Um, and so everything in this area right here is bacteria. Um, so it's single celled uh, and lacks nucleus. This area right here uh, is archaea or archaeobacteria. And then everything from here is a eukaryote. And so um, it'll have a uh, nucleus with a uh, membrane wrapped around it. Um, it'll have membrane bound organelles and so on. And so everything that we consider um, animalia, uh, animals will be found in this uh, clade right here, Opus leucantica. And so Opus leucantica includes uh, things like fungi and uh, kingdom animalia. Um, so it's an extremely broad uh, clade of organisms, even though when you look at this entire tree of life, um, really it's just a single point. And so within this, uh, uh, this group of eukarya, remember I said uh, we're in Opus leucantica, and so Here's Kingdom Animalia right here. Uh, this group, it doesn't seem like it would, um, is or is very related, but Opsoconca includes things like fungi, uh, quinoflagellates, which I'll get into a little bit more later on, and then the Kingdom Animalia. So each of these is a kingdom um, within itself. You should recognize this phylogenetic tree. This is the one we'll be talking about uh, from here on out. This is one that we'll be using almost every uh, lab and lecture period. So this is Kingdom Animalia right here. Uh, so it includes everything from periphera to chordata. The quinoflagellates are the outgroup. Uh, if you remember um, our little review of phylogenetic trees, the outgroup is just uh, a group of organisms that uh, share really only one characteristic. It's the most recent common ancestor um, that still shares uh, many of the, uh, the characteristics as the rest of the group, but it lacks a key one. So in this case, uh, it's multicellularity, um, and I'll get into that when we start uh, diving into the phylum periphera. So when we get into uh, kingdom animalia, everything in this group is going to be uh, one of three things. So everything will be eukaryotic, hence the domain eukarya. So this means it's going to have membrane-bound organelles uh, and a nucleus. It's also going to have linear DNA. Um, other organisms, 
such as bacteria, can have their DNA in a circle, um, in a circular shape, uh, while uh, everything in the domain eukarya will have DNA in that helix form uh, that we're used to seeing on basic biology slides. Everything's going to be heterotrophic, so it's going to be utilizing organic material uh, as its energy source. Um, there's very few, in fact, I think there's only one organism in Kingdom Animalia that actually photosynthesizes, uh, and that's a flatworm, um, which I'll talk about several weeks from now. Actually, I believe next week um, when we get into platyhumanthes. But everything here uh, either eats other uh, organic matter uh, for its energy, um, Nothing in the Kingdom Animalia is actually able to produce its own energy. Um, so, uh, that's very much uh, unlike uh, Archaeobacteria, which is found in um, places like the Hot Springs and Yellowstone. Those can produce their own energy uh, through um, uh, from uh, chemosynthesis. Um, plants, uh, obviously not in the kingdom Animalia, they're in the kingdom Plantae. Those produce their energy uh, through photosynthesis. Um, and so, unlike both of those groups, the kingdom Animalia is heterotrophic. They have to eat other organisms, eat other organic material in order to uh, generate energy uh, and metabolize that energy uh, or that food into energy. Uh, to uh, reproduce and do other things that animals do. The third thing that is a common characteristic in the anim animal kingdom is that everything is multicellular. Um, everything from periphera to, to chordata has more than one cell, and all those cells work together. Um, they cannot survive on their own. So if you take a skin cell out of your arm um, and you put it on a slide, uh, it'll die. Um, if you take a, uh, a cell out of a petri dish of bacteria and uh, put it somewhere else, that cell, that bacteria will survive because it's single celled. It's capable of reproducing and producing its own food uh, without the help from other cells. So multicellular organisms don't have that ability and most of our cells are specialized to form um, for uh, specific functions. So we have muscle cells that help uh, our bodies uh, contract our heart, uh, pull our lungs down. We have special cells for breathing. Um, so all of our cells depend on each other for uh, such what we consider basic functions, such as respiration, uh, digestion, um, and even reproduction. So that brings me to our first phylum, uh, uh, the phylum peripheral. This is what we consider the most basal uh, group in the kingdom Animalia. These are the most primitive organisms. And so uh, I kind of keep touching on this. Uh, it's called the quinoflagellate theory. Um, basically, uh, there's a lot of uh, visual similarities between uh, this group, quinoflagellates, uh, and um, uh, a cell that's found in the uh, phylum periphera known as quinocyte. So quinoflagellates are uh, these single-celled but colonial organisms um, that have a single flagella right here that they undulate back and forth uh, to remove particles uh, of uh, food out of the water uh, and then bring it towards their actual body here. Since they're colonial, they create a water current and they slightly work together. Um, they are uh, single-celled, uh, um, so if you take a single one of these coanoflagellates out of this colony, it will survive on its own. So the theory goes, uh, the coanoflagellate theory uh, runs along the lines that several of these uh, colonial uh, coanoflagellates were working together, um, creating higher water current, drawing in more particles of food, um, consuming more, uh, being able to reproduce more, uh, and over time they're selected for, uh, and so becoming more colonial, working together uh, became a new trait. Uh, and finally, after several millions of years, uh, these organisms 
formed a uh, uh, formed specialized cells uh, and became uh, what we consider sponges today. And so you can see the visual sim similarity between the coanocytes uh, and the coanoflagellates. So the coanocytes uh, had the same flagella. That flagella undulates through the water, um, drawing in food particles. But now, instead of having it just free floating in the water like this one, there's now a body uh, surrounding these coanocytes, and then they draw water in uh, through pores uh, in the body, and then the water is then pushed upwards. So um, that's coanoflagellate theory in a nutshell. Uh, this happened right before the Cambrian explosion uh, when um, life really took off. There was an explosion of diversity, uh, especially in the seas of uh, our Earth. And so this was really early in evolutionary history, roughly 600 some million years ago. So modern day uh, sponges, um, or what we consider the phylum periphera, they're sessile, uh, meaning they will not move. Um, once uh, a sponge is on a substrate, it stays there for the rest of its life. It doesn't move, it has no ability to move. They are aquatic. Uh, the majority of the species here are uh, marine. Um, roughly, uh, there's about 9,000 described species, and roughly uh, 300 or less um, is there are uh, freshwater. So I mentioned that uh, they're closely related to coanoflagellates. And so they are filter feeders. They use those coanocytes to undulate uh, a flagella. That flagella brings a food particle closer to the body of, uh, of that coanocyte. And then they use archaeocytes to transport um, those food particles throughout the body. Since uh, they don't have a mouth and they really don't have a, uh, a true digestive system, uh, they can only eat uh, food particles that are smaller than themselves. Um, so this means just small particles of decaying matter or uh, single-celled organisms that are floating by in the water column. Um, and since they don't have any true digestive system, they don't have a stomach like we have, uh, they have this process known as intracellular digestion. And so this means that food particles are taken into each cell individually and then digested from that point. Uh, reproduction occurs uh, in cells through uh, a couple different ways. Uh, you can have two different gametes uh, being produced by uh, sponges. Uh, those get broadcast out into the water column. Uh, when those gametes meet, uh, they settle onto the substrate and form a new sponge. You can also have uh, asexual uh, reproduction occurring in sponges, uh, and this one's the much more common version. So you can have a sponge uh, creating a new uh, individual off the side of it. That's known as budding. You can have fragmentation where a piece breaks off of uh, that sponge. Uh, these sponges are rather brittle. Um, they're made out of calcium carbonate or silica, so they break rather easily. But once uh, a break has occurred, um, that, that, that piece of uh, sponge that's fallen off can form a new individual. There's also gemulation. Uh, so if uh, one of these archaeocytes or coanocytes uh, needs to uh, form a new individual, uh, it's possible that way. So I mentioned uh, that everything in the kingdom of animalia is um, multicellular, uh, and that's definitely true for the phylum periphera. So there are these true uh, specialized cells, but it doesn't have any um, any like uh, systems. Um, so it doesn't have a digestive system or a reproductive system or or whatnot. So going off those specialized cells, um, we have um, uh, what's known as the sponge seal. Uh, this is just this 
large opening. Of, so first off, I'll go through a couple that are not cells, just kind of basic anatomy. So the osculum here is this, this wide opening on the top of a sponge. So if you want to look at uh, the sponge that we have right here, uh, it has this extremely wide opening covering the top of that sponge. Um, so this right here would be considered the osculum. The sponge seal is just this empty column in the middle. Um, so that so you have the osculum covering the top, and then the sponge seal goes all the way down into uh, into the to the base of the sponge. You have uh, the quanocytes, which I keep mentioning, and those line the inside of uh, the, the sponge seal. So uh, as water is drawn through this sponge, um, those quanocytes they're undulating that flagella, and then they're drawing out food particles from the water. Since they're undulating uh, that flagella, they move in a rhythmic pattern, and that creates a water current. So it draws water in through what's called a porocyte. This is a specialized uh, cell. So water flows through these porocytes into the uh, sponge seal and then out through the osculum. So one of the benefits of this is that it uh, draws in oxygen, uh, which is necessary for uh, all cells to uh, function. Um, they need oxygen for cellular respiration. So it's drawing in both food uh, particles and then oxygen. Uh, as the cells respire, they release uh, carbon dioxide um, and then other waste products. Those waste products get uh, passed upwards uh, out through the osculum. So generating this water current uh, is extremely beneficial for the sponge. Um, and that's why many of the sponges that you'll see uh, and the following slides are shaped like a tube, uh, so they have the osculum up top. It's basically uh, like a chimney. Uh, all the waste products are flowing up and out of that organism. So uh, other uh, specialized cells uh, in a sponge, there are these panacocytes uh, that line the outer layer of the sponge. Uh, this covers uh, the sponge's um, and it allows uh, it to keep in, um, uh, where is it called? The archaeocytes, uh, it also allows it to, uh, uh, it basically forms like a, a protective layer uh, around the outside of uh, that sponge. It also uh, provides uh, a barrier for the mesoheal. Um, so that mesoheal is just uh, this, acellular matrix, so acellular meaning it's dead material. If you look at this sponge, uh, all you're seeing here are spicules and then mesoheal. Um, all the living cells have died and been, been washed off really. So I mentioned spicules. Uh, spicules are these uh, structures right here, um, the structure right here, and so these uh, provide support for um, the actual sponge itself. They also provide defense um, from other predators. So they're usually made of uh, silica or calcium carbonate. Um, yeah. Uh, spicules are uh, secreted by sclerocytes. Um, it's not shown in this picture. So if you look at this one, uh, this is what a sponge actually looks like. Um, they're not uh, always as simple as uh, the one on the previous slide. So you have this osteo right here. Um, water flows in uh, into the sponge seal and then out to the osculum. You have these quanocytes uh, lining the inside of those osteo. Here you have the mesoheal, uh, and then each of these small lines are uh, the spicules right there. So the mesoheal and the spicules are providing structural support uh, for that uh, sponge. So uh, this is what uh, a spicule looks like. So this is an SEM, scanning electron mic uh, microscope image of different uh, spicules. So 
As I mentioned earlier, uh, these provide structural support. They also provide defense against the predator. So if you were to bite into a sponge, um, you would get a mouthful of these spicules. And as you can see in this really early drawing, uh, they, are, they look very sharp. Um, it would be a very unpleasant experience. When you're uh, using a natural sponge in the shower and you're scrubbing your skin, um, what you're doing is you're basically just taking those, uh, those spicules and using it like sandpaper across your skin. Um, all those little silica barbs uh, and spikes are rubbing against your skin. Uh, one neat aspect uh, of spicules is that they can form these really intricate uh, designs. So this is in the uh, in the class Hyalospongiae, um, which I believe is the next slide. Uh, well, one of the next slides. Um, so when we go through the taxonomy of uh, sponges, there's um, really only one difference between each group, and that's well how their uh, spicules are formed. So, uh, so the sclerocytes will secrete either calcium carbonate or silica or spongin spicules. And so that's how we base, uh, base our taxonomy of these sponges. So the first up is the class Calciospongiae. Um, in previous years, this has been known as uh, the class Calcera. We only have one specimen. Uh, it's in this tiny uh, jar here. Um, and I'll try and get a photo out for everybody um, so that way we're not all touching the same vial and then passing it from class to class. Um, also that way uh, you're not being thrown something on the lab practical that you have no idea what you're seeing. So this uh, is a relatively small group uh, in this phylum. There's only 500 described species. Um, but each of these species has calcium carbonate spicules, um, hence the name Calcera uh, or Calcia spongiae. Um, obviously, the first part of that name, Calcia, refers to calcium um, or calcium carbonate, which makes up uh, their spicules. The class I referred to earlier, uh, Hyalospongiae, um, this uh, is the group of sponges that have really ornate uh, silica spicules. Um, and so they're known as glass sponges. Um, so right through here, all this white, uh, these brighter white lines, those are the spicules themselves. Uh, you can see here, uh, not the sea stars, but those lines are all the spicules. We have one in our class here. Um, it's very ornate. Uh, it, definitely earns the name uh, the glass sponge. Um, so these are uh, very rare uh, organisms. There's only about uh, 400 described species and they occur uh, almost entirely uh, um, in marine or areas, roughly from about 400 to 900 meters under the sea. Uh, and most of them are found either into the Antarctic uh, region or uh, in the northern Pacific. Um, so to have our own specimen uh, is a really neat uh, aspect. So once again, the, the defining characteristic for this class is that it has uh, only silica uh, spicules and then they also have these really ornate designs um, or structures um, that the silica spicules form. <coughs> So our third class, um, so we have three classes today. We have the class Cal uh, Calcera or Calcia spongiae, as it's now known as. We have the class uh, Hyalospongiae, and then uh, this is our third class Demospongiae. And so the majority of uh, these sponges um, have uh, spongin uh, in their mesoheal. So instead of um, having silica or calcium carbonate, they have this really flexible uh, um, material called spongin. Uh, they also have silica spicules. So we'll look at this um, on a slide uh, when you guys come into the lab Wednesday or Thursday. But basically, these spicules look like a Mercedes-Benz symbol um, without the circle around it. So you have these three points, uh, and each of those three points are uh, clear and glass-like, um, 
and that's because of the silica inside of them. So this is the most speciose class. It has 8,000 species. So out of the nine, or roughly 9,000 uh, described species of uh, periphera, 8,000 reside in this class. So this is the most diverse class. <clears throat> um, and this is really, um, well, if you, when you come into lab, I'll have all the sponges, or most of the sponges out. And you can see uh, we have uh, sponges of all different types. <clears throat> and so we only have one uh, specimen of uh, Calcera or Calcium spongiae, and one specimen of Hyalo spongiae, which represents really uh, relative non diversity of those two groups compared to Demo spongiae. Uh, and so uh, you have, I uh, already went over um, diversity, but uh, as a neat little fact, factoid, uh, the class Demo spongiae is what you used as bath sponges. Um, so if you buy a natural uh, sponge and you use it in the shower, um, it's in this class Demo spongiae. Uh, they've been used uh, for a lot of different purposes uh, over the past, uh, basically over human history. Um, if you look at Russian aristocrats in the early uh, 18th century, they would use uh, these natural sponges in the class Demo spongiae and they would rub their cheeks with it. Uh, and so the spicules would uh, abrase their cheeks uh, and they would turn a bright red. Um, and then they would use makeup or whatever to create uh, a whiter face. Uh, and so a symbol of wealth back in the day were these bright rosy cheeks uh, with a really pale face. Um, and so uh, they use the spicules in these bath sponges to basically make themselves look uh, much more wealthy than they probably really were. Uh, another kind of neat use of this class Demo spongiae, uh, several uh, dolphins uh, uh, will use a uh, sponge. And so when they're going along the seafloor looking for mussels or um, other invertebrates to eat, they'll pick up a sponge uh, in their mouth or their rostrum uh, and they'll, they'll go along the seafloor brushing uh, with that sponge. And so that's known as sponging uh, in dolphins. And so that's really only known. Uh, one neat aspect about that is it's passed from mothers to daughters. Uh, male dolphins don't display this trait as all, at all. Um, so it's really a uh, matriarchal uh, uh, learning aspect there. So really briefly, uh, I like to add in uh, diversity of periphera. Um, so this map shows basically uh, in warmer areas uh, you have high prevalences of um, sponges. So you also notice that in these cold areas like the Antarctic or um, the North Sea, I believe that's the North Sea, there's uh, a fairly high diversity that even rivals uh, subtropical areas, such as uh, areas around Madagascar and Mauritius, or even Indonesia. And so these are uh, hexactinolita. Um, they prefer these colder areas. Demospongiae uh, is found in these uh, warmer areas. Um, so the Caribbean, uh, the coast off of Australia, uh, and uh, Papua New Guinea. And I believe that's the Great Barrier Reef right there, uh, even the coast off of Japan, too. So one thing this map does not represent uh, is freshwater species. So this is solely um, uh, marine uh, organisms or marine periphera. Um, and so freshwater species uh, are really underrepresented. Um, so out of the 9,000 total species of periphera, uh, 8,000 of which are uh, in the file or in the class Demospongiae, uh, and then 219 are in the family uh, Spongilidae, and these are the freshwater sponges. And so, this is one from uh, well, I stole this photo from online. This is a photo from uh, West Virginia, and each of these green patches is a sponge. Um, there should be roughly around 13 species of uh, freshwater sponge in Tennessee. Um, 
there might be more, uh, but the work's still out there. Uh, I put the link to this article right here. Uh, it's made, uh, it was written by a guy named John Copeland um, in uh, 2015, I believe it was when it was published. Basically, it's a really simple, uh, a really quick read on uh, the diversity of freshwater sponges in Tennessee. And so, uh, if you really wanted to have a neat little master's project, uh, you could pick up uh, the, on the freshwater sponges of Kentucky. So I know this isn't really related, uh, but if you look at the fish diversity um, in North America, you have this bright red spot right here, uh, even into Kentucky. Uh, so Tennessee and Kentucky, uh, Georgia, Mississippi, these are the bright, uh, these, are, uh, these areas have the highest diversity because they also have um, a high diversity of uh, habitat, freshwater habitat for um, aquatic organisms. So uh, I mentioned this earlier, if you wanted to have a master's project or some sort of research project, uh, picking up on studying uh, freshwater sponges would be a very neat project to have. Uh, not very many people do this. Um, in fact, uh, there's really no data on sponges in Kentucky, uh, except for a couple uh, that are known um, from this study here. Uh, and then the University of Kentucky has their own geologic uh, timeline. So they use fossilized specimens of sponges rather than living spe specimens. So that's one as aspect uh, of a thesis project if you were to pursue that track. Um, in my particular opinion, that would be a, a neat project to have. So uh, as a little bit of a review of sponge anatomy, you should be able to identify the osculum. So just a review, the osculum is this big uh, hole at the top of the sponge. It's the very tip of, uh, if this were a chimney, it's the very top of the chimney where water flows out. An ostia, or uh, uh, singular is an osteum, is this opening along the side of the sponge. So I don't know if you all, you all can see this, all those little holes there, those are ostia uh, right there. So water flows in through these ostia. Um, it passes through coanocytes, uh, which line these channels right here. And then water flows into the sponge seal, which is the inside uh, of this area. It's this channel right through here. So water flows in through the ostia, into the sponge seal, and then out through the osculum. Um, you have panacocytes, which aren't represented or are not represented in this picture, but panacocytes uh, protect the outer edge of uh, the sponge. Um, they also act as barrier keeping in mesoheal um, and sp uh, uh, spicules inside the sponge's uh, well body. Uh, porocytes uh, are these uh, specialized sponge, uh, these specialized cells. So right through here would be a porocyte an ostia is this hole. Um, so you can think of it as ostia uh, as a whole. A porocyte is the actual cell um, that lines that, um, that channel. Next you have spicules. Uh, we've gone over this in a lot of detail, I think. And so those are the silica or calcium carbonate or spongin uh, Based structures that provide support or structure um, for the actual sponge. Everything that lines these channels is a coanocyte. Uh, you can see the small flagella uh, on each of these cells. And so, once again, that flagella undulates back and forth, uh, creating a water current. So, as water is drawn in through this ostia, it goes into each of these channels. And so, water or food particles are um, drawn into each of these coanocytes by that flagella. Oxygen is also drawn in um, and then waste products are then uh, carried out, this is like a maze, out through this way, um, out to the sponge seal and then up through the osculum. So this is something we'll do uh, in class, um, but I'll give a brief summary of it right now. Um, 
Everything that we've gone over today has been in the file and peripheral. There have been three cal uh, classes. There's calcarea, um, or calcia spongiae, as it's now known as. Uh, I need to change that on this slide. So let's see if I can write on this. Um, calcio sponge. Yeah, uh, good luck reading that. Um, anyway, uh, so it's not calcarea, it's calcium spongiae. There's the second uh, group that we went over, hyalospongiae, the glass sponges. Uh, and then there's the most diverse class, um, demospongiae, uh, which is the, like the bath uh, sponges or uh, barrel sponges. So the habitat that these uh, organisms reside in, uh, it's almost entirely aquatic, or it is entirely aquatic, um, but the majority of these organisms are marine with only roughly 219 freshwater species. Um, and roughly only 13 of which are found in uh, Tennessee. So I'm guessing around that number are found in Kentucky. Uh, as for symmetry, they don't display any. Uh, if you look at this sponge and you were to cut it across an axis, uh, you would have uh, an asymmetrical organism. None of the slide, sides would match up no matter what axis you cut it all, along. Um, so this organism doesn't have any symmetry. When we get into next groups like the phylum uh, Cnidaria or Platyhelminthes, we start to have asymmetrical or symmetrical uh, organisms. We don't have any true tissues. Uh, we just have specialized cells that are working together. Um, so tissues evolve later on uh, when specialized cells become more and more specialized uh, and start focusing in more specialized uh, uh, functions. We don't have any segments. Uh, segments uh, segmentations only found in three groups: uh, the arthropods, uh, so insects and crustaceans; uh, the annelids, segmented worms, uh, such as earthworms, and then chordates. All three of those groups we go on much later uh, through the semester. We don't have a skeletal system. Um, really. Uh, the water pressure uh, from the water column around this is supporting this, uh, this structure, as well as the mesohelial and the spicules. So that acellular uh, matrix uh, in combination with the spicules is what is supporting this organism in the water column. That's what makes it stand upright. That's what forms the, uh, the shape of this, uh, this sponge. Um, and that's really what allows it to, I guess, splinter from that spicule. Um, and that's really what allows it to uh, create that water current. So you have um, this, this mixture between mesohelial and spicules um, that form this shape. And so it's the shape that allows um, water to flow in and then out, uh, carrying away waste and carrying in uh, necessary food particles and oxygen. Reproduction happens in one of three ways. Uh, fragmentation, so an individual breaks off, uh, and that individual that is broken off can form a new uh, uh, organism. Uh, gemulation, uh, and then sexual uh, reproduction occurs through the production of gametes. Um, you have digestive system, uh, is very basic. So instead of having uh, what we would consider a stomach, um, which would be intercellular uh, digestion. These organisms in the phylum periphera only have intracellular digestion. So they can only eat uh, bits of food that are small enough for each cell to uh, have or digest. So anything smaller than uh, a cell is what these um, organisms are eating. Circulation uh, within uh, a sponge is basically uh, caused by the water um, current. So as water moves through uh, that sponge, um, as the water current caused by the quantoflagellates undulating that, or not quantoflagellates, quantocytes undulating that flagella, that's what causes uh, necessary nutrients, uh, food particles, and oxygen to flow throughout the body of that sponge, uh, and then those diffuse into each cell. The same thing occurs with waste. Uh, 
such as carbon dioxide that diffuses out of the cell into the surrounding water. And from there, it's carried through the sponge seal and then up through the uh, osculum. Same thing with respiration, excretory. Um, these things are not solving uh, rocket science. They're not doing complex calculus. They don't have uh, a nervous system. Um, they're just individual cells working together. Um, and then once again, they're sessile, they're not moving. So this organism uh, is firmly planted onto uh, this rock. Uh, it's not moving anywhere unless a piece of it is broken off, in which case it moves to a new location. So uh, for you guys to go over, uh, just know um, the theory behind quantocyte evolution, basically the quantoflagellate theory. So basically, I'll go over this again. Quantoflagellates are these single-celled colonial organisms uh, that uh, have the superficial visual uh, resemblance to quantocytes found in the phylum periphera. So the theory goes that um, groups of these colonial uh, quantoflagellates or undulating their flagella um, uh, uh, better than uh, smaller colonial uh, groups of these quantoflagellates. Those groups that were able to uh, pass more water through its, uh, through its colony were able to reproduce more uh, and work together uh, more cohesively. That group was selected for time and time again uh, throughout history. Until so you had cells developing um, specialized functions, uh, and then you have the remnants of the actual quantoflagellates uh, forming these quantocyte cells in the phylum periphera. Another thing you should know uh, are the different taxonomic groups um, that I went over in this, uh, this presentation. So there's the three classes there's the phylum, uh, or in the phylum periphera, there's the class uh, calcium spongiae um, with calcium carbonate based spicules. There is the class hexactinolita, or now it's known as hyalus spongiae, um, and that's the glass sponges. Uh, they have silica based spicules uh, that form these ornate patterns. And then you have demo spongiae with spongin or uh, silica based spicules. And they'll, they won't have those, uh, those ornate patterns like hyalus spongiae. They'll just look like barrel sponge, this. Uh, I don't have any specimens for uh, demo spongiae, uh, that family of freshwater uh, sponges. Uh, I wish I did, but don't. Uh, if I ever find any, I'll be sure to put it in this lab. Uh, and then the next semester will be screwed. Uh, we'll have one more thing to study. So, But for this semester, you don't have to remember the name uh, demo spongiae. Um, yeah, I uh, didn't really go over the function of the archaeocytes. Basically, archaeocyte cells uh, travel throughout the body of the sponge. They move throughout that mesohyl, that acellular uh, matrix that forms the body of the sponge. And so those archaeocytes transport food particles to each of the uh, specialized cells that don't have their own way of uh, grabbing food particles from the water. Uh, you should also know sponge anatomy. Uh, I feel like I've gone over that. I'm just beating it into your heads, but I'll go over it one more time. So water travels through porocytes. These are the holes along the side of a sponge. From there, uh, or I'm sorry, travels through the ostea, which is the hole, into the porocyte, um, which is just the cell that uh, surrounds that hole. From there, water flows in through uh, the porocyte into the sponge seal, so the big opening, pointed to the camera, the big opening in this sponge. From there, water will flow upwards and out, uh, out of this osculum, which is this big opening right there. Uh, before water enters the sponge seal uh, and leaves out the osculum, it passes uh, through quantocytes, uh, and so those have that flagella that's constantly undulating. Uh, and drawing in food particles uh, and passing it towards the body of, of that cell. You have uh, spicules uh, and mesohyl that make up this, uh, this body, provide structural support. So when you see a dead sponge, which you will on Wednesday or Thursday, 
uh, all you're seeing are spicules and mesohyl. Um, everything else, all the other organic material has already uh, decayed away, um, leaving just the shell of a sponge. If you look at bath sponges, um, those are just uh, silica spicules um, that have been soaked in acid, um, or those are sponges that have been soaked in acid, leaving the silica spicules uh, behind. Other anatomy uh, that you should know, um, you have the archaeocytes that travel throughout the body or the mesohyl, um, transporting uh, nutrients from um, the craniocytes throughout uh, to the, um, the other specialized cells that cannot produce their own food or grab their own food from the water column. There's the panacocytes, so these perform or provide uh, a barrier along the outside of the sponge, um, basically acting like a like a, a layer of skin, like what we have. So you can think of panacocytes like the skin of a sponge. Um, I think that's it. I've gone over porocytes, panacocytes, uh, osculum, spongiceal, quanocytes. Uh, Archaeocytes. That should be it for anatomy. Um, so, uh, when you come in on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, we'll be working on the microscopes. Make sure you wash your hands before touching the microscopes. Um, there will be these small alcohol pads in front of each microscope. Use that to wipe down the eyepieces. Uh, you can also use it to um, wipe the, the knobs. And I'll show you different parts of the microscope. I'll go through different um, uh, basics um, and best practice procedures when using a microscope. Um, I'll make another review video um, like I did last week that goes over everything that we've done in class. And I'll review a little bit of what I did uh, in the past 45 minutes um, going through this lecture. Um, I'll figure out a way so that you guys can see each of these individual vials of calcarea or calcium spongiae and hyalus spongiae um, without uh, risking um, you all touching the same vial uh, and getting some sort of disease from it. So uh, next week's plan is to cover two different phyla. So today we only covered one. Um, next week we'll be covering two. So we have the phylum Nidaria or the jellyfishes, um, or, and we have the phylum platyhelminthes or the flatworms. So these are two really uh, neat groups, um, and in my opinion, it's a fun lab to be in. Uh, with that, uh, I'll leave you all here. See you uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Remember to wear a mask. Um, remember to take the quiz uh, on Blackboard. Uh, and yeah, I'll see you all then.